Unless everyone watching this video was raised by media, most of the words that you have heard were uttered by someone that you never knew and will never meet. Your conceptions of right, wrong, good and bad, successful and unsuccessful, are informed not by some social group that you were born into, let alone your autonomous decisions, but instead by a mass culture. For myself, it would be hard to overestimate the effect that NBC's The Office has had on me. Jim and other characters in that show were in many ways my socialization of what adult life was. This has been true for the public for at least the last 30 years. In elite circles, you can convincingly argue that it's probably been true for at least 200. The experience of escape through media cuts across generational and national lines. No one alive today has any memory of a universe before mass culture. But something changed significantly in the 2010s with the advent of large recommendation algorithms. Slowly at first, but with rapidly accelerating speed, reality, meaning the actual physical stuff we lived in, has been replaced as the central source of experience of our lives. In its place is the product of an extremely complicated optimization problem, where your preferences are its objective function. The significance of this should not be lost on you. The world you live in, including this video, is catered to you by an algorithm that aims to give you exactly what you want. You cannot outwit it, and candidly, you probably shouldn't even try. But you should be aware of it, and how it affects you. In my previous video, I discussed the idea of prediction and knowing as symmetrical pairs of each other. This video is in many ways a sequel to that. If you haven't watched it yet, that's okay, but I recommend you watch it first. The human brain is not well understood by anybody, but a good analogy comes from computer science. Here we find decisions being reducible to an n-dimensional weight matrix, optimized against some loss function. In less abstract words, we take in a stream of experiences and try to create an internal model that generates data similar to what we already have observed. <clears throat> As data comes in, we adjust our weights so that they minimize the difference between our prediction and new data. While this is quite similar to how programs like ChatGPT are trained, humans are even more remarkable. If for no other reason than we are able to develop stunningly complicated models with almost no data. To give some context to the scale of the difference between humans and modern AI, simply look at our relative training data sets. The exact size of ChatGPT's training set is difficult to verify, but the lowest estimate I've seen is 410 billion tokens, essentially words. Assuming you were talking to a human and somehow managed to clearly articulate one word per second, this would amount to roughly 13,000 years of continual verbal input. Humans are able to craft better sentences with less than 30. I'm far from being the first person to see how remarkable it is that humans develop the ability to speak with such limited input. Notably, Noam Chomsky has long been a notable voice arguing for exactly this perspective. However, it's important to ask the question of how we're able to do this. A part is no doubt shaped by what I will refer to as genetic memory, something that is extremely interesting but beyond the scope of this video. But that cannot explain it all. There are firm constraints on language, but they're wide and there's huge variety in how we structure sentences and define ideas. As an extreme example, think of sign language, an innovation that is at most a few millennia old and probably less than a few centuries. I believe the key to human remarkableness is the ability to empathize or internalize the experience of other people known or unknown into our own mental models. When we're speaking with someone else, we are not simply trying to generate a sentence that maps to other sentences we've already heard, an extremely superficial but essentially accurate perspective on the way that large language models work. Instead, we are trying to communicate to someone else. We are using language as a tool to translate our subjective reality into physical form. By doing this, we broaden the scope of our data set. No longer are we constrained to simply our own experiences. Instead, we are able to internalize those of other people as well by almost allowing ourselves to be consumed by them. In the circumstances we evolved under, these experiences recursively came from physical reality, passed down in their own parallel optimization problem across generations between friends. They allowed us to model reality with a level of complexity we simply could not have with only our own experiences. When I say reality, I mean reality. The world that every human lives in is not the physical reality of material sciences, but instead a system of prediction models that are trained on the experiences that we have 
and those around us have had. With recommendation algorithms, people's matrices are not being trained on some pre-screened data set of true or otherwise useful information, but are instead a boutique reality that could differ hugely between people who are otherwise culturally and genetically almost identical. To many of you, this may actually sound good, even liberating. So what? I'm no longer an NPC. Instead of reflecting the thoughts of other people, I've truly constructed my own reality. Camus, the victor of 20th century philosophy, in my humble opinion, expressed this opinion best. Don't walk in front of me, I may not follow. Don't walk behind me, I may not lead. Walk beside me, just be my friend. There's so much beauty in this concept. The belief that we are all agents of ultimate freedom striving against the uncaring universe. But this is just simply not what we are. We are social creatures, neither blank slates nor pre-programmed, but mirrors reflecting eternity. Our prediction algorithms serve an extremely useful function beyond simply language. Due to shared socialization, we are able to make impressively subtle predictions about what others will do by constructing a mental model of them with our, our own brains. We can and do run simulations of how conversations with our friends or bosses will go. We predict what our parents would do if they discovered a mistake we made, or pour over a message to someone we like. Reflecting at every word, what would they think of this? This shared reality is what I refer to as the human psychic domain. To give an extremely intuitive case of how powerful this is, imagine driving a car down the road. You are able to almost entirely ignore the cars around you. Not because they aren't dangerous, but because you share a similar mental conception of how the roads function with other drivers. You turn a blinker on and every car behind you is able to simultaneously update their predictions of your behavior. You don't know these other drivers. There's no need to explain to everyone else on the road what you're doing. Simply by having an overlapping mental model, literally hundreds of millions, perhaps billions, every day are able to navigate highways at frightening speed with very little risk. What if I, as an American, was dropped suddenly in England? That I mean, any idea what happened. My prediction algorithm of behavior of other drivers would produce a huge amount of error and would endanger everyone on the road, including myself. This extends broadly across our behavior. Group behavior requires similar enough prediction algorithms to create powerful inferences from otherwise meaningless behavior. Of course, this creates true existential danger for us when reality and our conception of reality are at odds. We are struck with mortal peril. Because fundamentally what it represents is a threat to our reality. There are two possible sources of this error. First, it's possible that your model is a poor predictor of the real universe. Second, the people around you do not share a similar enough model. Determining which of these is the source of error is something that candidly we are totally unequipped to handle. At its core, this is the entire thesis of the video. A human psychic domain exists. It is important and recommendation algorithms are disturbing it. In important ways, we do not just live in society. Instead, society lives within us. Everything you hold dear is a product of real human interactions and not physical things that exist. Concepts like nationality, race, and even Newtonian physics do not exist in the world, but are instead a concoction of our brains that allows us to navigate the physical and social universe. Israel and Palestine are not engraved on the soul of reality. They only exist in the minds of humans, and yet they are able to create physical changes to reality. In many ways, the human psychic domain could prove as important to the universe as gravity. When we make predictions about where the Earth will be in a billion years, we're forced to reconcile with the preferences and internal reality of both modern humans and our descendants. This brings me back to the recommendation algorithms. Since our conception of reality is shaped not only by our experiences, but by those we hear from others, the exact stream of inputs matter a lot. To most young people, we live in what amounts to boutique realities that are the product not of any filtering for truth, but instead optimized solely for a combination of our attention and pleasure. In fact, Gen Z is so accustomed to living in a universe that conforms to their mental models that when it does not, as it never does, they're totally unequipped to deal with it. We do not have language to describe what it is a threat to our psychic reality and through proxy our actual reality. If you question this, I present you a challenge. Find a media figure you disagree with maximally. As a recommendation, if you're liberal, choose Andrew Tate. 
If you're conservative, choose Vosh. But who you choose does not matter that much. What really matters is that you would disagree with them. Look for a video of them calmly articulating an opinion on something that you hold a strong stance on and for which they disagree. Not them debating someone who you agree with or commentary from some YouTuber who you enjoy, but them with little pushback presenting their words in clear English. Whether you listen, monitor your own emotions. Thus as humans, we're in a fucked equilibrium. On one hand, our brains are this delicate and sophisticated optimization algorithm, always trying to understand reality, to make better and better predictions, and the data set that it's trained on is increasingly another sophisticated optimization algorithm, explicitly designed to feed directly into our preferences. We are spiraling down a cycle of increasing prediction error. Since other people exist and external reality exists, Gen Z is trapped in a world that fundamentally doesn't make sense. Since the error in our prediction is fundamentally the source of all of our fear and anxiety, this leads to increasing feelings of despair, as the world seems to be the creation of an evil chaotic god whose thumb rests firmly on the scale against righteous reason. Since sanity is at its core someone being able to correctly understand their place in reality and the causal effect of their behavior, to most young people the world feels deeply insane. So what do we do? I believe you should just remain in the contradiction. Simply embrace it. Because honestly, who gives a shit? Find a social group you share enough with that you do not feel insane. Respect the social system of knowing as something that you cannot change and should just embrace as existing. Maintain your own boutique reality like an English garden. Protect it from weeds or other insanity that will lead you down a path of chaos. And most importantly, the more life appears to not make sense, the more you should simply just engage with it.